Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 203 for Monday, March 4th, 2019. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you, Mr. Kent? Decently well, Mr. Hamilton. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Had um, I had an interesting gig this week with with Madhouse. Um, you know, these Madhouses are. I've, I've described them before. They are all one off gigs, right? And uh, and 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 it's always interesting and different. You know, it's 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 episodic content in in a sense where you know there's it's uh, there's a loose story being told and it's different every time and the songs are sort of used to to sort of communicate that story and and so you you go in and you never quite know what to expect and I don't really even understand the story until. Uh, at best, the end of the gig. Sometimes I, mm. I even miss that. Right? Go. Oh, I'm worried. I'm worried about like playing and and all that stuff. And um, and and I had actually two really interesting experiences. One that's related to the, my setup here, and one that just happened. So I'll I'll go with the the unrelated one first, and that is at the end of the gig. Uh, you know, we um, it was this was the theme of this one was WitchCon. Uh, which is like a witch games thing. This is the third time WitchCon has happened because it's our third season of Madhouse, and uh, and and so they said, "Hey, look, guys, uh, to the band, our, our director, you know, Brandon and Ben, said to the band, look, um, when when the show ends, you guys play something that will, uh, you know, that that'll bring people down to the dance floor, down to the stage as a dance floor and, and kind of get the post party started or whatever. Sometimes they'll play stuff on the house PA or whatever, especially if the final song is not a band song or whatever. And it was like, OK, so make it something uh, that fits into this theme of, you know, witchy stuff. And it was like, well, it, actually, that's pretty easy. So, you know, and and make it something we've never played before, because the the point one driving like prime directive of Madhouse is no song shall ever be repeated. Right. Mm. Which makes it interesting and fun. And so it was like, well, uh, thankfully, we've threatened to do this song before, but we have never done it. And so uh, Superstition was, you know, the tune. And and the band already knew it because we had planned to do it uh, one show into last year or something. So, yeah, the show ends. We're playing Superstition. And about halfway through the tune, this this woman, young woman, uh, comes and like stands right next to the band and is watching what we're doing the whole time. And I'm, I gotta be perfectly honest. I'm totally, usually totally clueless when someone, um, is, is, is like taking action to express, uh, interest in me, like really clue, like it so <laughs> clueless about it, especially at gigs, which is where, you, you know, which is where this happens more often <laughs> than basically anywhere else. Um, not that it happens all that often, but, uh, or maybe it does and I'm completely unaware of it, but like, I am so clueless about it that it's a wonder that I ever found Lisa and, and we were able to, you know, strike up a relationship. Um, one of which I obviously am very thankful for. So, but I like this woman was being so obvious about it that even I noticed. And, and so we're playing the tune. I'm kind of laughing and, um, we finish the song and and then they start house music or whatever. And I go to get up for my drums and she's like right there. Like I can't escape the, you know, the thing. It's like, okay, here we go. So she, yeah, she's fine, you know, introduces herself or whatever. And, uh, and, and I remembered a comment that a friend of mine made completely unrelated to this, but he's a guitar player. And he said, you know, I don't like to touch people at gigs. And he's like, I especially don't like people shaking my hand because he's worried that he I guess he had somebody like squeeze his hand too tight one night or something. And as a guitar player, he's you know concerned that if somebody mm. does something too tight, maybe he can't play the next night. He's like, so no matter what it gigs, it doesn't matter who they are. I fist bump them. And for whatever reason, that thought came to my head and it was like, oh, this is perfect. Not that I'm worried <laughs> about her squeezing my hand too tight, but it's like if I give you a fist bump. That should communicate to you that this is the extent of the touching that we will be doing this evening. You know, 
And so, sure enough, the fist bump worked, and and she sort of disappeared. And then uh, Lisa and Skylar were there. Lisa missed all of this too, but Sky saw it immediately. And evidently said to Lisa, uh, uh, we have to go down on the on the stage. You know, we've got to rescue your husband. She's like, what are you talking about? And she's like, well, there's that, you know, blonde or whatever. And Lisa's like, yeah, I'm not worried about it. And she's like, no, 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 we have to go. And so <laughs> Sky and Lisa came down. And as soon as they came down, then she saw that and she left. But yeah, it was uh, the fist bump was was a perfect way to uh, politely extricate myself from that situation without putting this woman in a position where she was going to embarrass herself. So mm. it, was, it was good. So I share that. How, did, well, does this happen to you? Off, like, how do you deal with this? If it happens, I know a lot of folks know your wife and stuff at gigs. So that often tends to, you know, disperse these sorts of things. So, and I've actually tried to make a really conscious effort of, of cause just it's, we're not kids and right. you know, this is not what it's about anymore. So yes, no. I make a, I, I do shout outs to my wife and, as tasteful a way as I can during gigs. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm with my wife during breaks and those types of things. And so, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to build a, a fan base based upon that. You know, right. That right. It's not, a, it's not sustainable. B probably won't happen anyway. C, <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's flattering. Don't get me wrong, but also like, that's the most, either one of us is going to get out of this is that I'm flattered and thank you. And you know, you go. we're good to go. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, to me, it's not, it is flattering. And uh, I think we had a conversation a couple episodes ago is that that line I have to be careful of because, you know, I'm a decently friendly human being. And, you know, so, and right. I thank people for coming to the show and, you know, I, I asked them about them, but remember I had that conversation about a couple of fan relationships that turned into obligation feeling things and yes. then ruined the fan relationship. And so that's one part of it. And the other part of it is, you know, there's just, just no there there. Right. You know, so right. it's not going to happen. Whatever, right. whatever that is, it's not going to happen. And yeah. Fist, yeah. fist yeah. bump seems pretty, pretty way to telegraph your intentions. Yeah. Like, hey, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Woo. Like, yeah, you are. Yep. You are a, a, a magnetically charming human being, though, Dave. I got to say, I can see this very clearly. Well, I'm glad you can see it. So like, I, <laughs> I'm clueless to it. You know, you said it, it it's not about that anymore. And I, I get that a lot of people start playing instruments to, to like to, to meet members, uh, you know, of the opposite sex. Like that's a thing. Or it, the same sex. Or the same sex. Right. That's true. Meeting meeting romantic partners is probably a better way to say that. Um, I it 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 it, it like. I met Lisa because I, I of playing in bands like I, it definitely has been something that has allowed me to meet, you know, people it allowed me to meet my wife. Uh, it allowed me to meet you. Not that there's any romantic involvement there, but like music has introduced me to, to some fantastic people. Uh, but it was never really like it was never about that for me. Mm -hmm. um, it partially because I'm just clueless to this whole thing. <laughs> so yeah. maybe I didn't quite realize that, you know, the power I could wield with this when I was younger and, and might have cared. I don't know, you know, but yeah, <laughs> it just wasn't. Yeah. So it's always really awkward for me. It's like, oh, that's right. There's that thing happening again. OK, right. <laughs> Got to deal with this. Crap. Can I go hide? No. Shoot. I get a OK. Fist bump to the rescue. <laughs> well, you know, I, I was told a story about a band that uh, played bar gigs, like true bar yeah. gigs, not not club gigs, but bar gigs. Yeah. And um, they were working pretty hard. And their their bass player was in his late 60s and was evidently quite a hound and and really worked that aspect of his life pretty hard. Sure. Um, I think it puts the band in a little bit of a, you know, challenging thing, Do you, you know, because, it, you know, it these can. are interchangeable parts that, you know, they, it reflects on the rest of the band, especially, you know, again, when you're in your twenties, you know, you're dumb and the attention and the availability and the singular, you know, being a single person is one thing, right. but you know, as you get later into life, I don't know. So yeah. I don't know. I get it though. I mean, you, you know, there is, that is a, a, a given that, you know, the stage adds 10 degrees of, of, uh, of uh, desirability. How's that? I, uh, I like that. That some, is some of us five degrees, some of us like me three degrees, but I mean, I think, I think uh, you get that, uh, you know, under the bright lights can definitely create a, a vibe for someone, especially if you're good at what you do, or at sure. least you get 
impression you're good at what you do, it definitely can be a magnetic thing. And well, and if you translate that you're having fun, like that's a big part of it. If you can somehow translate that, and I, I, I didn't. People want to touch that, right? They want to be where the light is. Exactly what it is. And I, I wound up singing lead on, on you know, our rendition of Superstition that night, and that always, you know, that's an easy way to to draw focus to yourself, you know, intentionally or not, right? Like everybody's going to watch the singer. Um, so that, you know, that's part of it too, but yeah, it's just always interesting when, and it, again, it, you know, I say it's always interesting. It's always interesting when it happens. It's, it's, um, but the skill is actually to, to not insult the person, right? Cause they're not, you know, the they're part. not coming to you out of a, out of hostility or, you know, no. they, they genuinely are supportive of what you're doing. Maybe they want a little bit more to touch that support in a different way. But, sure. you know, a fist bump, uh, Hey, yeah, we had a good night tonight, you know, or, you know, thanks so much for coming that's 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 that same skill that you and I talk about about when yep. you w- walk th- when you work the room between sets you know how do you do that small talk that doesn't make you sound like a jerk because it's so insincere and communicates genuine appreciation for the for the you know gratitude for your art i think that that's a if you if it doesn't come natural to you every every musician should have that if it yeah. doesn't come natural to you, figure out where, what your place is with that. Because I, I believe that is part of the deal, especially as you're fighting for gigs. Yep. Um, yeah, you got to you have to be comfortable with people who want to be friendly. I, I, I don't I, and I'm saying this carefully. You don't necessarily have to be friendly if that's not who you are, uh, but you have to be able to fake it. <laughs> and there's a big distinction between, you know, someone coming up and showing interest and our famous episodes of people behaving badly. That, that yeah, is a very was, big difference from that. This was not that. No one was behaving badly here. Like this was, you know, and, and that's honestly what made it more awkward. If somebody's behaving badly, well, then, you know, that sort of gives you permission to to compartmentalize them. Right. And dismiss them in, a, yeah. in an appropriate way. Uh, but no, this woman was, she was actually very friendly, but, you know, again, perhaps wanting to be friendlier and like, mm. no, not, not here, not me, but you know, cool. But, like, but thank here's you. a fist bump. But here's a <laughs> fist bump. And she's like, oh, did you have fun tonight? I'm like, yes. Did you? Like, great. Thanks so much for coming. It means a lot to mm. us. Put a lot of time in, you know, that kind of thing. Cool. I mean, you just, you know, sort of steer the conversation. But I, I, I felt like the fist bump was a perfect representation of Let's define how this is going to be, you know, <laughs> and 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 it did like her complete demeanor sort of softened um, when after the fist bump, it was like, oh, right. There's a, there's a yeah. wall. I get it. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Yeah. I, I I think I shared this before. I'm bad at the wall. I should be better at the wall. Um, I'm genuinely the gratitude I feel when someone wants to come up and say, you know, we were good or you know something like that, you know. It, it, I I have to be more vigilant in that stuff in general. Yeah. And, um, you know, because, again, it's uh, you don't want to be that guy. You don't want to be that that uh, houndy guy. So. Right. Right. Unless you do, I guess. Unless you do. Unless that's your shtick. Yeah. 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 So, so the hey, other I've thing. Got- oh, OK. Are we switching topics? I was going to I was going to but go ahead. That's fine. You yeah. sure? Yeah, sure. It doesn't uh, matter. I don't know. Right. We got we got plenty of time. About, yeah. <laughs> I want to tell you about an interesting uh, situation we're having with a local booking guy. So there's a local booking guy. We've worked with him most years, one gig, a couple years, no gigs, very few years, two gigs in a year. He's a good guy. Um, he's um, he's well-liked. Um, he made a comment to our sound guy last year that, you know, I would love to do more with you guys during a gig that we work together. I would love to do more with you guys, but you play so much. And I, you know, I, I need it you know, the gigs that you do for me to be a little bit more, you know, time and distance separated. So they're unique things. Fair. So sure. yep, fair. It is fair. So we sat down we had a conversation and the conversation was like, I understand you want to do more with us. I'm down for that. I like your gigs. I like how you do production on your gigs. I like, you know, I like you, I like working with you. So, you know, what can we do? And we kind of threw out, you know, a couple of ideas and there was one gig that, he offered in a town that last year we played three times over the summer, three different sources of the bookings. One was the town itself. One was another booking agent. One was this guy. Sure. Um, and I said, if you give me that gig, cause the gig that he had is, you know, one of my favorites to do. If you give me that gig, I'll say no to the other ones. And 
we're going to talk about more work together. Right. So he goes, great, done. So, uh, we agreed to that. Um, as I'm following up about the more work together to yeah. do, I'm not getting any responses. And in fact, you know, now as we're, I'm getting busy, I'm saying, listen, I know you do this one series and it's one that we talked about. I'm going to hold a date for you. And he didn't respond to it. Or he said, you know, not ready to talk about it or whatever it is. And then when he finally was ready to talk about it, it was as though he had ignored, you know, that the, the availability that I was sharing with him. And I kind of honestly felt as though he, you know, he knew I couldn't take the date that he was going to offer. Right. Right. But it was like, I, that's kind of how I, I don't know if that's actually it, but that's kind of how I felt. And then there was, another gig that he um that he represented that he told me about when we sat down and every time i asked about it i got no answer at all so anyway um i get an offer for another one of the gigs in this in this town and i send the guy a note and i said hey listen i know that i said i wouldn't take these and i'm not going to take this but you know we had a conversation about doing more together and one is not more right one is the same one is the same yeah exactly yeah. yeah and so i would you know I want to talk about it with you. I'm not going to take it until we talk, but you know, I kind of think like, you know, the other things we talked about have kind of fallen by the wayside, didn't get a lot of attention. You know, I'm no better off. Right. Yep. Uh, I'm worse off actually. I was just going to say, it's not that you're no better off. You're worse off. I'm worse off. So he sent me back a note saying, I thought we had a deal. And, and uh, I said, let's talk about it. But, you know, I just wanted to kind of hear your response to this. So again, he's a good guy. Um, I don't, I can't, way how real he was about the other things you know the gigs he has are pretty good and i'm sure he gets hammered by a lot of bands i kind of felt like he started this conversation by saying i'd like to do more with you and the absence of more and in fact less is a bad sign and you know there's a little bit of communication trust that's now up in the air i'm not gonna say it's killed or damaged or anything like that, but it's a little bit up in the air. Well, yeah, this is one of those things, right, where, I mean, in any business, but certainly in this one, cutting deals where there are n- like nebulous line items is a tough promises thing. of future work. Pro- yeah, but 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 nebulous promises of future work, yeah. not. And I'll get you into that town series and that town series. You know, in in August, you can't pick next year's dates. I understand that, but we'll talk in February and we'll pick those dates or whenever it is. And and so, I mean, I, you know, of course, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? You know, I, any advice I give is only because I know now know the scenario you're in. Right. But like it, for anybody listening, when you find yourselves in these scenarios, especially where the the future, you know, the, the line item has to be nebulous at some level. Right. Where it's like this. It's like, yeah, I'm going to get you into that. OK, cool. Can we put a, a time limit on this? Because I know I'm going to have to turn down those other gigs starting in in March or, you know, when, whenever. Right. You've got enough of a history with these other places to know when they're going to start asking and booking. So can we lock this down by February 15th? And and that way, you know, I know it's August. That's six months away. It gives you time to, fi- you know, to for these towns to figure out what they're doing and you to sort of find things. But we know that we're going to talk by February 15th and nail all this down. And then that way I'm comfortable telling, you know, my guys that I've got to sure. give up on these other gigs. Like, it, again, in, in high, I don't know that I would have thought of that at the time. In fact, I probably wouldn't have. But now I will. You know, like that's the, and not just here, but, you know, in my business business life, too. Like this is a good, fair thing, especially because everybody with the day you make the deal, everybody is generally um, unless you're dealing with some sort of sociopath and, and you will encounter those. <laughs> right. But in, in general, like the day you made the deal with this guy, I would say that it's fair to us. You're a good read of people. You know, it's fair to assume that this guy meant everything he said to you at the time. Mm hmm. But time has passed and I have a sticker on my desk downstairs that says time kills all deals. Right. Because it's true. And and time can erode all uh, excitement, too. Right. Like that's part of why it kills all the deals. And time changes our memory and all of that stuff. So being concrete about something when you know you can't be concrete about the entirety of it. But, you know, putting a time limit on it and. And then even just following up with an email saying, hey, man, thanks so much. Uh, I look forward to talking in early February next year uh, about, you know, these these dates and really kind of seeing what 2019 is going to look like for us together. That way, you know, you've sort of 
reiterated the message that, yeah, we had this conversation. Here's a thing. So because you're in a pickle right now, like this sucks. It, he remembers that you agreed not to do the other two gigs in his town be, or that town. Beyond <clears throat> that, he doesn't seem a little bit amnesia. Be, yeah, yeah, a little bit amnesia. There you go. And, and I actually think that that's the if, answer in there is, you know, so I. I, I sent him a note and I said, you know, in very professional, let's talk about it. I'm not going to take this till we talk, right. but here's where I'm feeling. It actually, I believe, will be very revealing the response. Yep. If the response is only we had a deal and I remind him, but the deal had a couple other arms and legs and we're not willing. Then, you know, then I misread the guy and there should be some cognizance that yeah. what started out as a basic statement of I want to do more together, ending up costing me a couple gigs. That's not a good situation. I would think that he's a musician as well as a producer. You know, he should get that. Yep. Uh, again, he's a well-regarded guy. He's a well-liked guy. And I think he's a good guy. But now we're into it. We're now we're into a disagreement, basically. And I'm trying to keep it discussion level and, you know, trying to put. But I think actually the response is, is what you need to know. And then again, it all goes back to how bad do you need the gig? How bad do you need this booking that, guy on your side totally in, in the future? Yep. What's the value and, of this person to you? They've their value has now changed in at least up in the air. potentially. Right. Yep. Uh, and so what's the value? What's the future value? And of course, part of that, you don't know. You got to have this conversation. So, yeah, but I think what you have said is actually the smartest thing. And I should have known better. I mean, literally, I've known this guy for a long time. So I thought a handshake intent to do more together was enough. Yeah. Um, but it's never enough. It's never, ever, ever enough. Nope. And, and unfortunately, like, you know, especially with bar gigs, you know, there's no contract and that type of stuff. And even though we say, you know, do stuff, but you've given good advice saying, you know, even if there's no contract, you send an email confirming this is what we agreed to. And now you have something in writing and that, you know, it, again, whether you're going to litigate it or whether you're just going to use it as an arguing point in the future is up to you. But, but having something that kind of closes the loop. And I actually do have that. I actually, you know, have an email after our first meeting that said, cool. Yes, we agreed to this and we're going to work on this and, you know, this type of thing. Yeah. And again, I would think if he, you know, if he wants a relationship with us and the audience that we bring to, to his events and he thinks we're good, he would have some ownership of the fact that uh, I couldn't get you into those this year. I, you know, my bad on the on the communication for those types of things. Let's figure out how to make it right for everybody. If, yeah. if in the absence of that, then I misread the guy and I misread the situation. Right. Like that, that would be the worst. That would be the worst case scenario if this person is a stand up person. Right. Like that. Like, oh, crap. I screwed you on this. I am sorry. Let's yeah. fix it. Right. Like, I mean, we all do that, especially six months later. I mean, who you know, who knows what this guy went through in the last six months. Right. You know, he might have had a death in the family. He might have had a he might have moved like there might have been some major life event. And he totally yeah. spaced on this. That stuff happens. But in he my area, needs there to are, own that. Yeah, absolutely. In my area, there are. um about five guys who control a lot of the, you know, they actually have businesses where they go out to the civic concert series and the festivals and say, we'll do production for you. We'll hire bands for you. You're, you're a, a park and rec department or you're a, you know, a, a, a downtown yeah. business association. You don't know anything about this stuff. We can take care of it. And they build businesses. So there's one guy in the South Bay. There's one guy in the peninsula. There's one guy in the East Bay, North Bay, San Francisco. And um, they all kind of have their own little chunks of the world and they control them. Uh, and, uh, those are good relationships. And this guy's one of those relationships. Yeah. And again, we've known him for a long time and I'm not, I'm not going to throw out that relationship yet until we close the conversation. I think the premise of it is, is worthy of a conversation of people Absolutely. who are going to be yeah. respectable, you know, business people doing business with each other. Win, win is the goal. There's another guy who controls a lot and, you know, he is, he's extraordinarily consistent. He's like an umpire whose strike zone is off but consistent right <laughs> so this guy is like you know you send him a note saying hey you know checking in any gigs can we talk by the phone you'll get a two word working on it that's about all you'll ever get from him yep. um and i don't you know i'm assuming everybody gets that from him it seems to be a, a very well crafted well polished style for um for uh dealing with the myriad of of requests that he gets all the time. And we've had years where we've played a lot for him and we've had years where we've played nothing for him. I can't tell you why one or the other, he doesn't want to talk about it. He will book you if he wants to book you. He doesn't want to network. He doesn't want to socialize. He just, uh, you know, says, you know, how about this? 
No. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Anyway, talk to maybe, maybe talk to you again. Maybe, you won't yeah. even get that. You won't even get that. It just, it'll, it'll close it. It's up to me to reach out the next year and say, Hey, you know, I know you're doing these five. Here's my availability. He, you know, he's not going to book based upon my availability is something I've learned. So, right. you know, I don't have leverage in that conversation. And I don't know, he's, you know, not in addition to doing the cover band circuit, he does touring band productions as well. So, you know, he's a pretty savvy guy and, and uh, I don't know how much of his financial life comes from the cover bands versus the touring bands, but um, I will say this, he's consistent. Yeah. that And that's fine. And my I'd, guess I'd is, of course, yeah, if you can predict this, then that makes it way easier. My guess is that this other guy, like, it sounds like he's he's been he's established enough that if he were the type of person to knowingly screw people in this way that you would already have heard about that. Uh, that's my yeah. guess. I, but, yeah. it, you know, who knows? I'm saying I, I've had enough years of relationship with him to know he's a decent guy. I know he's a musician. He's complimentary about the band's chops. <laughs> And again, this all started from a, I, w- I would do more with you, but you guys, you know, you're too busy and my events won't be special if I, if I book for these things. Yeah. So that's fair. I'm, that's yeah. totally fair. Right. But you know, w- what's the give and take for these things? So, right. Right. you know, and this is more, I th- I'm going to give it benefit of the doubt. This is a sin of, of uh, omission, not a sin of commission. I think yeah. I, meant it when he said at the time, I think he went on to his life of which I am not the nearly the most important thing in the world. The other events were ready to book when they were ready to book. You know, I get maybe me saying he offered me something that I couldn't take is a little bit more facetious than I want to be about this. But, but um, it's, it's, uh, I hope that that conversation, like we started in this place doing more together. The net of that is I have less gigs as, as a total because of this. Yeah. And we're definitely not doing more together. So, you know, what is what is the deal? And again, you know, actually, depending upon his answer, I might even not take the other gig in his town that I've been offered. Right. Right. Oh, no. that you, Like, that's a choice you're going to have to make, even if the answer is. I only have one for you this year. That's if right. he has, if he has zero for you this year, well, like that's also a choice you need to make. But I think it gets much easier to to just go take the other gigs, right? I agree. But if yeah. his answer is, "Oh crap," like not, huh, sorry, Charlie. If it's sorry, sorry, Charlie, I only have one for you this year. Book it, lock it in, and go take the others, right? Like screw yep. this guy. But if it's, oh, holy crap, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, you know, I only have one for you this year. Well, now you're in kind of a weird situation. Is this guy going to be the same level of flake next year? Will you only get one next year? Like maybe that's where you say, OK, look, I need to be able to turn around to my band and tell them why I've made the decisions I'm making. I'm with you on this, but I got to have something in my pocket now. Right. So. Can we guarantee that this will happen next year? You know, what? how can we lock this in, right? Like that, I, I think that's a fair answer, especially if he's sort of on his heels a little bit, like, oh, I'm really sorry about this. Find out yeah. if he's really on his heels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we'll figure out where that is. Other thing I want to tell you about is, so we, um, I've had a good productive first part of the year. So I redid our website. Yeah. I got a new logo for our 20th anniversary. So something special. And now I'm into merch and, um, you know, we're booking a great summer tour, you know, a lot of things going on and it's been really busy. And it's been really great. I want to talk about merch a little bit because okay. I'm revisiting this whole, this thing. Merch is a, a, uh, interesting thing. I, in many years in the past have gotten stuck with many t-shirts. Um, so say we all mostly, <laughs> so say we all. Yeah. And actually, I would say that the main reason that I've gotten stuck with, with many T-shirts is literally uh, not a consistent path to selling them. Having someone willing to sit at a table, yep, you know, it, for for twenty gigs, you yep. know, don't to forget to bring them. Yep, yeah, all <laughs> yep. that stuff, all oh, that stuff. Ability to take money, ability to take car, charge cards, ability to take you know, make cash, make change. So. Um, uh, so far I'm into three vendors. So I use a vendor called Steve Clayton for custom guitar picks. They're kind of cool. I use a vendor called sticker mule for, um, stickers. Sticker mule just ran a really cool, um, promotion. Uh, they will do 10 die cut 
stickers of your logo for a buck. So I thought I'd try them out. They came, sure. they're beautiful. They're really nice. The, the service was great. The website was really easy. The, the way that they die cut it was really cool. And so that, that's kind of cool. Now I'm ready to reorder now that I know what they look like. Yeah. And then there's, um, there's the whole t-shirt and different types of t-shirts and different styles of t-shirts. And you know, it is just a crazy thing. We've done episodes on merch before, oh, but I'm yeah. going to dive back in here. Cause oh, I'm, yeah. I'm up to my waist in it again. So, um, I use a vendor called custom Inc. Uh, they're probably one of the better known online printing, you know, organizations. So they have good selection of quality products. Um, you know, I like particularly soft t-shirts. I don't like the cheapest t-shirt just to get the cheapest, you know, they, they, they shrink up and they are uncomfortable. So I, I will pay more. And I don't think anyone's terribly price sensitive about these things, whether they're going to pay 10, 15 or 20 bucks. I, I haven't found at least out here that that's what the problem is. Sure. So we have um, this great logo and I went to custom Inc and on the front, it has full chest, great logo on the back. It has a 2019 tour and make some comment about, tw- you know, our 20th anniversary sure. and uh, custom Inc now has a feature. They d- it's not really an online store that they offer, but you can use it as an online store. Got so it. they have this feature called group orders where basically you can take um, you, what you have you can get a URL. And the funny thing is like, if you go right through their site, you have to have a different URL for each item you're going to sell, which kind of sucks. But if you call them, their reps have the ability to combine mm. things into one page. And basically, like I said, create an online store. Nice. The pricing, they set the pricing. So I think this was all set up to raise money for fundraisers. I'm not sure exactly it is, but I can't set the price. The price is whatever, you know, the cost is of the t-shirt and the printing. So they set the price, right? Okay. Do you get to make any money, any profit from this? Check it out. Here's how it goes. Yeah. So say uh, you... Uh, go conservative and you because they, they ask you how many of these shirts you, you're going to buy. So I have right now a men's T-shirt, a men's long sleeve T-shirt, a woman's tank top, uh, a men's baseball jersey yep. and a youth, a youth size. Right. So five items are in my store. The baseball jersey just looked really cool. I worry that what it's going to do is water down the orders in total and give people too much choice and confuse them. That's but a, that's a marketing a problem, accurate right? Con- concern. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we'll take the t-shirt. So they ask you when you set up this online store, how many do you think you're going to sell? You give them a number and then they tell you what it costs at that quantity. You go low because if you go high and you don't make that much, then people, you're going to have a difference. Yeah. So the, the, the deal is you go low. Um, so say for t-shirts, it says $20 and 61 cents to for 24 t-shirts, for example. Um, if you sell 36 t-shirts, the cost will go down and custom ink will send you a check and you get to decide whether you want to refund people or whatever it's going to be. But essentially that's how you that's make your money. profit. Yeah. Okay. That's essentially, and you don't know what it's going to be because you don't know how much you're going to sell. So like I told the guys in the band, you guys make your order and whatever the end um, price is, I'll give you guys back. But to the general public, you know, they're going to pay and they're going to pay what they're asked to pay. And if it ends up actually costing me less then that will be the difference. And I put, you know, a fair amount of money into the artwork. And so I need to recover sure, that. You got to recover. Some, it's yeah, it's, yeah. It's not just about the, the, the t-shirt themselves. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yep. So it's a good solution, but not a perfect solution. There's another company out there that I've been getting information from called merch, merch.ly. M E R C H dot L Y. Yeah. And they actually um, are progressive about, about information. They, they give you, you know, good guides for how many you should order at each size. They talk a lot about band merch and how to, and how to, you know, financially, they actually have a guide to, to band merchandise. So mm. they actually have a, you know, specialty in talking to musicians and, and they have some interesting things, but I was already set up with custom Inc. Um, I'd done some business with them before and I had a problem with an order before and they handled it really well. So I felt like I wanted to give them more business. So that's, that, a that's huge why I'm still thing, man. Cust- you know, I I don't say this all that much on this show, but on my small business show, I say all the time, every business is the customer service business and the people that get that are the ones that keep their customers. And so, you know, no business is going to be perfect because it's perfect for them, right? They need to build the business that they can sustain. But if they're, 
if they've got good customer service, that's, that's, you know, that's huge in my book. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And so for, they both have this facility where you can upload your logo and design online and see what you're getting, but there's a little bit of voodoo in that. Right. So the problem I had with custom ink was I designed online, the logo looked a certain way on the shirt. And then when they came to me and it was an order of like 144 shirts, um, it wasn't what I designed. And I called them up and I said, Hey, you know, Oh. Look at what, look at what I signed off on and look what you gave me. And, um, you know, they had a process by which they were like, well, you know, you, you can send them back or you could keep them and we'll give you, you know, they had like a way to yeah, handle a this. way to deal with it. Sure. Right. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing was I said, nope, we're going to send this one back. Then we sent a second order and it was the same thing. And I was like, Guys, Guys, you know, now, now I'm three weeks, four weeks into this and, you know, shows are going by that I could have been selling these things and, you know, I need to get going. And they handled it in a very um, responsible customer service oriented way. That's great. And so, you know, I'm a customer of theirs now, uh, you know, and they've got my business, you know, for the foreseeable future. But this Merchly looked actually pretty interesting. And, I, you know, I might give them a try for something else. But then funny thing. So the point of this whole crazy story. So I have this, this link with this faux online store and I, you know, put the, the, um, logo up on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook on the house rockers, Facebook page. Yep. And I said, here's I'm so happy to share with you guys, our new logo and new 20th anniversary merch is now available with a link to the online store. And it's not getting much, much love. So the advanced ordering hope, uh, is a little soft right now. I'll, I'll report back if it changes, okay. but after one week of this stuff, it's been pretty slow, but a lot of people saying, Hey, I'll look forward to picking one up at, at the show, which somewhat makes sense. They want to hold it up and make sure the sizing is right. Yeah. Even though the, even though the custom ink site has a sizing guide and you can actually, that's, you know, that takes a couple more clicks and a couple more times. So I think we're going to end up back where we always end up, which is taking a guess, yep. making an order, yep. finding someone to man a table, you know, being really committed to it. I don't know. Is there, is there a better way to do it? Do you, have you I've seen where like t-shirts will be available at this gig and then you promote it like that. And so you don't assume that it's going to be at everyone. Well, yeah. Creating that, uh, false scarce, well, scarcity, whether it's true or false is sort of irrelevant, but yeah, creating that scarcity, like, Hey, our, our merch store is open for two weeks and that's it. Right. And right. you can't get these at shows, right? Like if you want people to order online, you have to tell them that's the only way. Right. And then three months from now, you can say, oh, good news. You know, we sold out of that run, but change one little thing so that like those are what they were. You know, they're the special edition. Now here's another thing. And OK, now we'll sell these at gigs or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think if you want to do online orders, there has to be a reason. Scarcity. Yeah. yeah you've got to have it. Yeah. It yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Other, Cause otherwise people will be like, Oh yeah, I, I can get one at the gigs. That's perfect. You know, that's perfect. Yep. I don't need to order one. That's what a, what a pain in the neck. Yep. So that, 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 that would be, that would be my thoughts on that. But I mean, yeah, we'll, I mean, we'll I think find what we out. Can we, yeah. we can bundle them with uh with a ticket price or something like that. Exactly. But, yep. But at the end of the day, you know, you can't take a $20 ticket and make it a $40 ticket to include a t-shirt. That's just too big a jump. And so, yep. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. If anyone tough. out there at cover band land has, has a successful, vibrant, ongoing merch process, please share. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I, I know when we were on the road with the clam bake, which was, you know, 30 years ago, maybe 30, 20 something years ago, whatever it was, uh, merch was a huge part of our financial lifeblood. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we rarely had anyone other than band members to sell merch. I mean, we did actually, as the tour progressed, you know, there's always somebody that's going to be at every show and you're like, Hey, you could be our merch person. Cause you know, we all hated doing it, but, um, but you know, it was, it, it initially, especially it took that dedication of, all right, you know, as soon as set break starts, somebody's always on the merch table and you know, you're there and, and, you know, hawking t-shirts and, and making change and you know, all that good stuff. Sorry, a little audio issue here, but, um, but yeah, that, that, you know, that was the way to do it. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Right. So, um, I, you know, I mentioned there was something else that I kind of thought about with, with Madhouse and rehearsal for this one. It was every Madhouse is different. Uh, this one, we had three string players with us, a, a cellist, a violinist, and I can't remember, maybe a violist and, uh, 
And so there were, you know, different tunes that we had to go through and rehearsal with them. And, and then we had a bunch of tunes without them. And, you know, so rehearsal on Tuesday was a different thing, but the same, right? Because it's always different. And man, it just went so well. Like we were, we weren't just playing through these songs. We were actually like playing them. And it was like, man, this is weird. Like Madhouse never feels this way. You know, it's always so hurried and rushed. And it wasn't that we had any more time. It was just everybody was fairly prepared. And we all trusted that everyone else would be prepared, you know, and and that makes makes life way easier because it's like, okay, I don't have to drive the bus 100 percent of the time. I know that. You know, my fellow bandmates are going to know the tunes at least as well as me. Maybe I need to step up my game, you know, those kinds sure. of things, uh, which is great. And we had this really great rehearsal and the gig went fine. But I noticed about halfway through the gig, it's like, oh, you know, like we're not we're we're not in it. We're we're playing the songs. We're doing what we need to do. But, you know, and th this is just like, I don't know that there's anything that one can do to change that, especially in the moment. But it's just one of those things where wow, we got, you know, and sometimes it's the rehearsal that's flaky and the gig is just like butter, you know. But mm. this was one of those where it was like, no, the rehearsal went easy and smooth. And we had some things to work through and, you know, definitely had our our um, our work to do. But uh, but it was just like, you know, that that thing where you can relax into it a little bit like you can when you've played songs 20 times, you know, it, um, and for the gig, for the Madhouse gig, I, I, for me anyway, um, I just, you know, it was just like, okay, yep, we're playing everything. It's fine, but we're not in it. We're just doing it, you know? And, uh, I, I don't, I don't know what the magic answer to that is to be perfectly honest, but, um, but it's always interesting when you kind of find yourself, when I find myself in the middle of a gig, and I'm like having to work to play every note, not just letting them all come out. And, I, you know, it's just it's just how it goes sometimes. But it's one of those things that. Um, yeah. yeah, it is um, that feeling of disappointment when it's just you're, you're excited for it and it's just not right for some reason. Yeah. You know, whether one guy's lack of preparation. I just did that um, gig with that band I put together yeah. for and, and I. Remind, reminded myself to really temper my expectations. It's a pickup gig. It might be a one-off. I told the guys, this is no pressure, but still in my mind, I spent a lot of time and, yeah. you know, there were little things I was excited to feel as I was kind of interpreting these songs. That, stuff like it's that. Ex the excitement to feel it. That's it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just, that's why you chose the song. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right. I mean, especially with these, I mean, you know, with Madhouse, we don't pick the songs, but you know, I mean, you, you, you know, you want to play them and feel them and like, you know, with yeah. a cover band or whatever, like that's the only reason to do it is you're, you're feeling the, the tune, right. You know, so Absolutely. yeah, yeah, it's interesting, but um, I don't, you know, it's just like one of those things it, but it's, it's the thing that makes me think, okay, well, if I practice more, you know, and, and it, this is definitely true. The more you practice at some level, I mean, you can certainly over rehearse, but um, there, there is, you know, a, a level that it, you can err on the side of, of over rehearsing and actually be okay coming in, really knowing these tunes so that it really is like the 20th time you've played them with this band, you know, and, and you're just in it. You're not thinking about, Oh crap, did I miss the change or whatever? You just know them. And, and then you can just play, um, sort of along those same lines. I, I think it was the, the night after Madhouse, but it may have been this weekend. I can't remember. Um, Steely Dan played some gigs, uh, in Europe this past week. And one of them was with, uh, Steve Winwood. Maybe all of them were with Steve Winwood. And, and I think he sang Pretzel Logic uh, with them and played organ on it and stuff. And so I watched that video and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. We, we played Pretzel Logic and Flank. So it was kind of cool to see Winwood, you know, kind of do his thing with it with them. And then, you know, as things go with YouTube, I just kept watching more because there were more videos of this same show. And there was a video, the encore of Reeling in the Years. And oh, I can't remember who it was, but they had, I think the guy that played the guitar solo on the original album back in like 1972 or whatever, uh, he was, he was playing with them. And so it's like, oh, cool. You know, I'll, I'll watch that. And I was immediate. I've played Reeling in the Years. I, um, the, this band Sea rock that I've filled in with here and there uh, quite a bit over the last couple of years, uh, 
they play reeling in the ears and, and I've learned the tune. It's like this shuffle thing and shuffles I've, I've mentioned are always hard grooves, you know, for drummers, but it, like this one's like, okay, it's a little fast, but you know, it's fine. And as soon as the tune started up, you know, it, the, the camera was mostly on, um, uh, on, on Donald Fagan and the drummer was right behind him. I did not recognize who the drummer was. I, I, it has been a long time since I've seen Keith Carlock. Uh, I used to know what he looks like, but now he's a little bit different. And so I did not recognize that it was Keith Carlock. Mm -hmm. um, and man, like as soon as the song started, it was like, oh man, there's a whole other level that, that you can play this song at. Like, whoa, yeah. like this guy's, I mean, and I always say you've got to pretend like, you know, you got to make it look like you're working harder than you actually are. Right. Cause people like that resonates with people. If they see that you're putting in effort, you know, you can't just like lay back and play and expect people to be impressed by that. And I'm sure there's some level of Keith Carlock's performance that just naturally does that because he's a pro, but he was also really in this. And like, you could see him at every break. He would, you know, there's, there's like those two beat breaks in the middle of the tune where the turnarounds mm -hmm. are, he would take a breath and then it was like right back in it. And he was relentless about this groove. <laughs> like it wasn't just playing a shuffle and kind of sitting in it. He was driving that bus like his life depended on it. And he wasn't overplaying. He was, you know, but he was playing and it was like, cool. Oh man. And it was inspiring. Yeah. To see somebody like, Oh, Holy crap. And then of course I looked it up and it was like, who's on tour with them. It's like, oh, it's Carlock. Well, no wonder. But, you know, not that it would surprise me that Steely Dan has, you know, top. The best of the best. Yeah, the best of, of the best. Of course they do. Yeah. But a friend of mine uh, is my friend Pat Marafiotti uh, is a keyboard player and has actually done some gigs with Keith here and there in, in New York and says that the guy's like, nicest guy in the world, but also like a total monster. And relentless was the word he used to describe his playing, too. So it did not. Did not surprise me when I put all the pieces together that it was like, holy crap. And it really like like there's it's it's just fascinating to for, for me anyway to to watch and see like, oh, there's a whole this whole other level of the way to play like that tune or that kind of groove. It's like, OK, yep, I can step up my like I can do that. It's it's not what I do right now, but I can step up and and like I can strive towards that. It's like, OK, cool. That's inspiring. Like, you know, it drives me to sit down and grab the sticks every day and like, yep. cool. yeah, yeah. So it's you, you know, I mean, we do these things, I guess I guess part of it is, you know, you're playing in a cover band or whatever. And like, it, it, you know that you can entertain people with such a low quality product, not, <laughs> not that we do. Right. I mean, we all beat that bar. Like that bar is so low that it takes nothing to beat it. And, and it's easy to fall into the trap of letting your own bar kind of sink a little bit, you know, over time, because you're like, well, it's still way better than that. Well, inertia is a big thing. Yeah. Right? So again, one guy in your band isn't prepared and it just doesn't sound right. Inertia kicks in. He's just that like way back. Is all right? Lowest common denominator. We'll get it done tonight, and that's fine. It, it it tends to be, and Steely Dan would probably be a great example of this. You really need everyone on stage to be like, all right, you you in? You know, we're we're challenging each other With tonight. Each other. You need a band yeah. environment that does that. And I don't know too many bands that actually do that. I mean, I know a lot of bands are just happy for the gig, and I know a lot of bands that are just happy, just happy to have gotten enough material prepared, much less drilled down to the, to the nuances of the material. Um, and you can work and you can go over and that can it's happen. Fine. Yeah. Right. But yeah. if you're a band that, you know, that drives the professionalism, that drives the musicality, that drives the musicianship, those are rare, I think, especially in the, in the cover world. I mean, I, they do exist, of course, in every market, I'm sure they exist. And um, and then there's ones that overdo it that are that are obsessed with the nuances. Yes. Remember, the, you know, there's a nuance to space as well. Yep. So it's not only technical proficiency or complexity that that requires nuance. There's space and simplicity is a nuance that's required as well. And so oh, absolutely. The music that you're depending on the type of music that you're choosing, you know, the nuance that you're going to emphasize and I say, you know, you say you have your great sayings. I, playing easy is hard. Playing simple is hard. Totally. I like it. Yeah. No, it's totally true. Yeah. We had one night, the first night we played at uh, at Broadway Studios with the Macworld All-Star Band. We yeah. had that vibe on stage where everybody was like playing their asses off and 
you know, it was it was a it was, you know, it wasn't a competition, but in a sense it was right where we were like, it just naturally happened that we were all driving each other to play better. And I would say we were all getting off on what the other guys were doing and it, and it drove each us, each of us to kind of dig deeper. But that man was an interesting, you know, there was such a wide variety of, of uh, expertise. Yes. <clears throat> so that was a little bit of a different situation, but the guys who had some experience, you know, we were playing down often to the level of the, of the least experienced guys. It's true. And then, you know, we would insist on finding a way to play up to, you know, we, and we tried some you know, freeway jam and we tried some <laughs> interesting things to kind of like, just say, let's go for it. Let's show, let's, let's go show some for chops it. off. Yeah, that's it. Let's go for it. We, again, like you said, you can go too far with that too. You can just overplay and, and then it's no longer musical, but there is that spot that you can get to and where some pros, not every pro, but, but, you know, more pros than not, um, get to every time. And it's like, man, Without a doubt. yep. Yep. So I, you know, I, it, my, my, my point in bringing this up on the show is just remember why you started doing this in the first place, because sometimes even though you're having fun, you know, kind of slogging it out and being, you know, what, what I'll fondly call, cause I'm, I'm it too, you know, being that gig whore and, and happily playing, you know, Mustang Sally and Sweet Home Alabama to please the crowds. There's nothing wrong with that, but don't let them set your bar for you, right? Yeah. Set the bar for yourself because even a tune like reeling in the years, I, I don't mean to say that it's an easy song to play. It's actually not at all, but you can play it and punch the ticket and everybody that saw it will be like, wow, that was awesome. And then you go and what you watch Keith Carlock play it. And you're like, <laughs> So well, there's another song there. <laughs> there's a whole other song there. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it's like, don't forget about that. Cause that, and that's, that's sort of my lesson to me is like, yep. Okay. Like, cool. That, that inspires me. Even if no one else notices, I notice, you know, and I, I, I will say that I think in every market, the bands that sweat the details will separate themselves from the bands who yes. are just good enough to get on stage. I mean, it, it may not be immediately obvious and obvious in the way that you would like it to be. But over time of putting on a tight show and, and, you know, and demonstrating, you know, that you're, you're, you know, we always say, what is different about you? What is special about you? Yeah. You know, sweating the details of stuff like that. And I'm not, I'm not even talking about an tribute band way. I'm just saying like, like being musically interesting and tight and together and fun, they will separate you from typical bar bands that, uh, that get through the songs. And certainly, you know, they're, they're playing the rock and roll fake book stuff and people will always love that. And there's a place for that. But if you want to separate your band and if you have guys in your band, then, now remember, you, you also have to have guys in the band with similar musical aspirations and chops, because what you don't want yep. is to be the one guy in the band feeling like, Oh God, you know, these guys are holding me back or the one guy in the band who can't keep up with the other guys. That is, uh, you know, that is a, uh, I'd a rather be that guy situation waiting to happen. Yeah. I'd rather be that guy. Like I've always tried to, to, in, you know, I mean, in different ways, this is always true, but I always, you know, especially when I was younger, tried to join bands with people that were better than me. So it's like, okay, now I have to get better fast. Because otherwise, I'm not I'm not going to be part of this anymore. <laughs> like they're going to cut right. me loose. You, you know what I mean? Like that pressure is a really good thing. And if you're not getting it, either because uh, you know you're the best person in your band, or and and again, best is is sort of a relative thing. I, no one I, I've never been in a band where the I could point to one person and say they're the best at everything. Right? Like you know, there might be somebody that's good at this and somebody that's good at that. But sure. Um, but if if you're not feeling that naturally as part of your band but you're still happy with your band, then go find it somewhere else and, and, and let it inspire you to, to, to play better when you are playing with your band. Cause that's like, you need to, I, I think that's a really important thing to, to stay engaged and probably a good way to avoid, you know, creating a, a you know, drinking problem at gigs and all those other things. <laughs> well, really like, I mean, if you're bored playing your tunes over and over again, that sort of opens that, that dangerous door to, yeah. you know, to all of that. And it's, it's like, look, we're, out there we're not making a ton of money doing this it's there's no point um in playing if you're not actually like they're having fun and and engaged yeah yeah so i think the bands that root for each other and you that's know, it yeah have a have a con a concept of guys limitations encourage them to you know go beyond their walls but not not dare them not not embarrass them into going beyond their walls right right, right. and a good leader will facilitate that i think but I a think good band true. yep a good band will nurture that. Yep. 
I think that's true. Yeah. So maybe that's the lesson is, is, you know, be aware of that and, and find a way in your band to nurture that. That's that. I like that lesson, man. That's what I'm taking away from this episode. So there you go. go. Yeah. Good, good stuff. Uh, you got anything else, man? Or are we, uh, we call on this one gig gab two Oh three. 203 in the books. 203 in the books. Folks, thank you so much for listening. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. I, I broke my own rule this episode. I, we have some comments from you and we did not address them. We will make sure to do that first next week for Deal. Giggab 204. Yep. Take it easy, folks, and uh, we'll see you next time. What is it? Paul? Always, what do we say? always, always, always. Be performing. Be performing.